all about the Marks E7 on this episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks. Hello again, this is Mike with another episode of Toy Train Tips and Tricks. I recently acquired this pair of Marks Diesels at a bargain price, $50 including shipping. I don't know why this particular pair slipped through the cracks on eBay as similar pairs were going for $90 to $100 plus shipping at the time. I guess I just got lucky this time. There are a few minor cosmetic issues, but I'm not too concerned about these. Putting the pair on the track, they run. The reverse unit likes to stick, but that's a common problem and it usually has a very easy fix. It's also sparking a bit and the strong scent of ozone tells me that it could use a good cleaning. Otherwise, everything seems fine. Whereas Lionel and other train manufacturers had abandoned tin trains in favor of die cast and plastic, immediately after the Second World War, Marx held firm with its dedication to tin lithography with only a few exceptions. But when Marx finally decided to jump into the production of plastic trains, they did so with the same focus on low cost and high dependability that had always been the hallmark of their train line. In 1952, Marx introduced its model of the EMD E7 diesel. The twin-motored 2,000-horsepower six-axle diesel was an excellent choice for a new model as it was commonly seen on most American railways at the line. More than 500 had been constructed between 1945 and 1948, and it bore a general resemblance to other popular EMD models at the time, such as the new E8 and the F-Series diesels. The Marx model was first sold in AA pairs with one powered and one dummy. In 1955, unpowered B units were also made available. Various road names were made in AA, AB, ABA, or single A unit configurations over the years. Rather than developing an all-new six-wheel drive, in typical fashion, Marx maximized value by modifying its tried-and-true four-wheel drive and adding false axles to the truck casting to give the appearance of six-wheel trucks. The locomotive casting matches 1 64th scale dimensions in length and height, but the shove is wider than scale to match O-gauge track and to provide room for the motor to swing freely. Most of the key spotting details are present, although some of the rivet lines are over-exaggerated. Overall, the shelve reproduces the look of the E7 faithfully. The E7 looks best with undersized O27 rolling stock such as Lionel's Scout-derived cars and the O27 streamlined passenger sets. Of course, Mark's cars look great behind them as well. Unlike most model designs that utilize a separate chassis, the Mark's motor and unpowered truck assemblies attach directly to the model shell, eliminating the need for a chassis altogether, significantly reducing manufacturing costs. Some hobbies have used this modular design to their advantage, creating their own twin-motored E7s or powered E7B models. If you're in the market for an E7, there are a few things to keep in mind. First, the earliest versions came with single reduction motors with no traction tires. Not only do these motors object to the guardrails on most of Lionel's turnouts and crossings, but the single reduction motor does not pull as well as later versions and it runs faster, having a greater likelihood of flying off the train table into oblivion. While only early Santa Fe E7s came with factory-installed single-reduction motors, these components are easily swapped between models, so always check before you purchase. Most E7s came with double-reduction motors, and these often have traction tires and even additional lead weights. As you can see, my version with weight and traction tires can easily handle 10 or more cars and a sizable passenger train. Also, check the shell for damage. The most frequently damaged parts are the steps, and you will usually find at least one is missing. Replacements are available from Grossman Parts. See the link in the video description. Also check for missing horns, and these are also available from the same source. Cracks in the nose are also very common. Mine has a small hairline fracture that can easily be reinforced with some glue. Larger cracks may require putty and sanding and might be impossible to hide without repainting. The next most common shell damage is a chip in the overhang on the rear of the lawnel. 
Unfortunately, this kind of damage is very difficult to repair. At the workbench, servicing an E7 could hardly be easier. There's a large screw on the roof of the model near the rear. Remove this to release the motor assembly from the shell. Next, disconnect the headlight wire from the motor assembly. This is usually a task with a simple Ferenstock clip, but it might be soldered in place. And you're free! My first task is cleaning the reverse unit. Find this paper-wrapped component and spray it with electrical contact clear. Really soak it. Shake the assembly around a little bit, then put it on the track. Set the voltage at around 14 volts and put the motor on the rails, rapidly cycling the reverse unit until it switches easily and consistently. Mine was good after about 30 seconds on the track. This works most of the time for a Marx reverse unit. To access the motor, you must first remove the truck side frames. These are attached by quarter inch machine screws at each end. Removal is easy peasy. By the way, if your side frames are damaged, the Robert Grossman site also has replacement parts for these. Looking at the motor armature, I can see thick black deposits on the commutator face. It needs to be cleaned. Remove the Phillips head screw at the bottom of the motor and the two quarter inch nuts to remove the brush plate. The brushes will come free as well. To clean the commutator face, I use electrical contact cleaner and cotton swabs. Spray the end of the swab with cleaner and rub. The crud usually doesn't come off as easy as this one does, but it does come off. Do not use an emery board for this as you may cause permanent damage to the commutator face if you rub it the wrong way or too deep. Inspect the brushes. This pair looks pretty good, but if you need replacements, the Robert Gersman site carries these also. Reassemble the motor and turn the wheels a few times just to make sure everything is properly aligned. Then replace the side frames, the headlight wire, and the mounting screw, and you're done. After a quick lube, it's back to the layout. Sharp-eyed viewers may notice the coupler adapter I'm using to connect the Marx E7 with Lionel cars. This is a test of a new and improved, I hope anyway, design of my coupler adapter. If it works, I will be posting the new design on Thingiverse and I will update the links in my other Marx pages to connect to this design. So far, so good. Speaking of couplers, you can find three varieties of Marx couplers just on these two diesels. Powered A units lack a front coupler and usually have a tab and snot on the rear, except in the rare cases when they were sold as single A units. Then a fork-type coupler is on the rear. B units will have either a tab coupler on one end and a fork on the other, if originally sold as part of an AB set, or a pair of tab couplers or tab and snot if they were originally sold as part of an ABA set. Non-powered A units will have a tab and slot coupler on the rear and a fork coupler on the front. Sometimes this is a non-operating fork design to avoid interference with the locomotive pilot. Santa Fe E7s were produced the longest and have many variations. As mentioned before, early versions have a single reduction motor and some have an extra long pilot as well. There are also differences in the size and placement of the number 1095 on these models. Some Santa Fe dummy A units lack any yellow paint in order to reduce costs to meet Sears' strict price points. The Santa Fe headdress logo on the B units may come either filled in or as just an outline. Of the E7 varieties produced by Marks, Santa Fe's are the most common and generally the cheapest. Rock Island and New Haven versions are also relatively easy to find but a New Haven set in good condition is highly valued because of its striking colors. E7s were also made in Western Pacific, with the gray version being more scarce than the green version, 
and thus commanding a higher price. Less common E7s include New York Central, Union Pacific, Allstate, and the rarest of all, Penn Central. Because they are relatively common, Santa Fe E7s are popular candidates for custom painting, especially if they have shell damage and are not in good collector condition. Mark's E7s easily negotiate 027 curves and turnouts. In the real world, the reign of the E7 was coming to an end by the late 1960s. U.S. passenger operations were being cut back, and there were plenty of newer E8s and E9s to handle what routes were left. E-units of all types could sometimes be found in fast freight service, such as on trailer jets or reefer trains. Some railroads, such as Rock Island and Erie Lackawanna, even re-geared many of their surplus E-units strictly for freight service. When Amtrak took over most of America's inner-city passenger operations in May 1971, they selected no E-7s for their fleet. Most of the few that remained at this time were quickly scrapped, but there was one Penn Central E7 still in the deadline at the Altoona, Pennsylvania shops. There is an oft-told story that, upon hearing about the impending scrapping of this diesel, a group of rail fans, armed with stencils and spray paint, scaled the fence of the shops in the dead of night and swapped this E7's cab number with that of a nearby SW1 switcher. The next day, shop crews hauled off the switcher for scrap, and the E7 survived. Whether or not this story is actually true, I cannot say, but it is true that this Penn Central E7 is the only surviving example in the world today. Resting comfortably at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in its original paint scheme and number as Pennsylvania number 5901. So, if you like the look of EMD's covered wagons and you're looking for a dependable runner, but Lionel's F3s are just a little too much for your pocketbook, consider a pair of Mark's E7s. A powered and dummy set of Santa Fe, Rock Island, or New Haven units can often be found for less than what you'd pay for a single Lionel F3. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it, and if so, please like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment about your favorite Mark's E7. Keep the trains running and we'll catch you next time on Toy Train Tips and Tricks.